Aristotle's Politics is not an easy book to read, and it is not a book that I recommend others read lightly. Modern readers, even readers with real sophistication in philosophy, real sophistication in politics, and a fairly robust background in ancient Greek writing, modern readers will very often completely miss the point of the text. And for large, crucial portions of text in the book, such as the chapter I guess I'm going to be discussing here today, I am just discussing one portion of the argument as an example, but it's much more than just an isolated example because the themes dealt with in this section of text we're talking about here, slavery, inequality, um, relations between men and women, husband and wife, political inequality and how you constitute a republic. These are very fundamentally tied into the knot of issues that Aristotle is addressing throughout the text as a whole. So it's a crucially important passage in itself. And it's also just one example of why it is that Aristotle is so hard for people to read and appreciate today, even when so many talented translators have worked on this text backwards and forwards for generations and generations to render it into English, German, French, almost every modern European language. There are ways in which we deceive ourselves. It's very easy to approach a text like this with an unexamined assumption of symmetry of intent, where you think, these are my intentions as a reader. These are my interests. Therefore, I expect the author from the other, the other side to meet, to, to meet my expectations, to mirror my intent. So my, my perspective in the 21st century may be, oh, I'm looking for a really serious, profound, sober, clear exposition of the most important ideas from political philosophy in ancient Greece. And that's what I'm expecting this book to provide me with. So if I don't find that, I may be disappointed or I may just be perplexed. What if what I actually find is a book with a lot of sarcasm? What if I find is a book with a lot of dense humor, inside jokes, and intentional use of paradox, paradox in the classical sense of confounding the reader, of saying to the reader the exact opposite of what they're expecting, presenting the reader with impossible contradictory claims, apparently just to befuddle or dazzle the reader. Aristotle was not producing a dry, sober text. You're going to see that in this example we're discussing, okay? He was not writing something to last a thousand years and thinking of how you'd perceive it from your, your cultural perspective in the distant future. Okay? He was very much writing for the audience of his time. He was writing for small groups of gentlemen who would sit around and read this out loud and laugh at the jokes. There's a lot of humor, and there are a lot of cultural references here that are just barely comprehensible today because we were lucky enough that the scraps of text being alluded to survived history. In some cases, they didn't survive. Okay, so um, I'll give the citation in the description towards this, uh, the, the, the descriptive text below this video. The, this whole passage starts around 1259 in the manuscript pagination, which is a system of keeping track of pages that's universal to all the, all the serious editions. Okay, so... Um, we have a passage of text here about the relationship between husband and wife. And we're told repeatedly, in a somewhat confusing way, that the inequality between husband and wife is very much like the inequality in a republic, in a polity. It's very much like the type of inequality written into the constitution of the type of mixed democratic and aristocratic society that Aristotle is describing for us throughout the work as well. So we already know he's talking about marriage. He's talking about slavery in exactly the same part of the text. He's talking about this type of inequality, 
But he, he's not even talking about it as an allegory for inequality in society as a whole. He's very much talking about it as an example of, as, as tied to intimately and profoundly the type of inequality in society as a whole. So we're told repeatedly that there's a relationship between husband and wife that's very much like the relationship between a politician and the public in this society. So there's some inequality between husband and wife, but he's not saying this is a simple biological inequality. He is not saying men are born superior and women are born superior. No. What, what does he actually say? The inequality between man and wife, I'm paraphrasing here, reminds us of the saying of Amasis about his foot pan, period. In your translation, it may say the emperor Amasis of Egypt. It may say foot bath instead of foot pan. You can be reading for several pages in a row here in English. And in a sense, the better the translation the English is, the more baffling and incomprehensible this will be to you. Because the more the translator has smoothed it over, the less you'll realize that the author is being intentionally paradoxical and provocative. We're lucky. We get the joke. Because the joke being made here, the saying of Amasis of Egypt, is preserved in Herodotus. And it's in part of the text of Herodotus that survived thousands of years of history. Some parts of the text did not. So if, if those chapters of Herodotus had perished and the flames had been lost to history, we wouldn't know for a fact that we do know that this is a very provocative, frankly snarky joke that he's making. What is Aristotle really saying about the inequality between man and wife and at the same time the inequality between political leaders and the members of the public they lead? The story about Amasis, that he completely presumes his audience, the type of refined gentleman engaged in political life in Athens who would read this at the time, the audience he's writing this for, they're going to stop and laugh out loud at this series of very provocative statements being made here about husband and wife, and the relation between the house owner and his slaves, and a politician and the public. Ah, oh, uh, yes, the emperor Amasis of Egypt. A man who was reviled by his subjects because he called himself a king, but he was born and raised a commoner, just as they, just as they themselves were. So what did he do as the story goes, as the legend goes? If there's any historical truth to this, I doubt it, but hey, whatever. The story goes that there was a golden foot bath, or foot pan, as this year. There was a, something that everyone who came to visit, everyone in the court knew well. They all washed their feet in. So I guess this was a, a foot bath at the entrance to the royal chambers or something of the, of the sort. And the text in Herodotus says that he broke it up into pieces and he assembled the pieces into an image of a god. And then he said to them, he said to, the, he said to the assembled multitude who followed him, he said, all of you now worship that god that used to be a footbath. In the same way you should recognize that I now am a king, I now am emperor of Egypt, even though I used to be a commoner. This is a bizarre and provocative image. But if you think for one minute that Aristotle truly believes that chunks of gold torn apart from a foot bath genuinely constitute a god that ought to be worshipped, you're crazy. Okay? That cannot be the purpose of this passage of text. It cannot be that Aristotle is saying to you, deadpan serious, with no humor, in the same way that the people of Egypt worshipped this foot bath as a god, in the same way wives should respect their husbands as their superiors. That is ridiculous. It's intentionally ridiculous. He's being paradoxical, provocative, snarky, sarcastic. He's writing with a sense of humor. And it's a very strange sense of humor that's very difficult to appreciate today. So what is Aristotle saying positively about the relation 
of husband to wife here. I would say it's not an overinterpretation to suggest that he's pointing to the extent to which the inequality between husband and wife is a social convention in our modern terms, and it is even a laughable social convention in the same way that this emperor in Egypt presenting a foot bath as a god is a laughable social convention. And yet, because people believe in it, it's powerful. Because people believe in the leadership of the king, he is therefore a king and not a commoner. A difference that is not biological, it's not magical, it's not the will of the gods. It's just social convention, and it's even a laughable social convention. Okay? In the same way, the inequalities he's talking about here, husband to wife, master to slave, political leader to the people being led, we're being given a very direct indication here that the real purpose of this text is not what it would seem at first glance, at first reading. Okay? Now, when you know that, and to give another brief warning here, throughout this whole text, Aristotle is absolutely hating on Plato. There's a lot of really, really negative, snarky remarks about Plato. So just a couple, a couple pages later, um, to really take apart the extent to which he's joking when he says, to speak in general terms and to maintain that goodness consists in a good condition of the soul or in right action or of anything of the kind is to be guilty of self-deception. Far better than such general definitions is the method of simple enumeration of the different forms of goodness as followed by Gorgias. Okay? So Gorgias, this is Gorgias with a, with a G. This is a, this is a famous dialogue of Plato. Now this whole passage, this whole passage, by the way, this is just sort of next page over from what I've just quoted you, this bizarre joke about the emperor of Egypt and his, and his golden foot bath being made into a god. Okay? There's a lot of sarcasm and snarky remarks paradox, him saying the exact opposite of what he really means. It is impossible for me to imagine that in this context, and when there's so much said against Plato through the whole text, Plato is the butt of every joke, Plato is insulted and denigrated constantly through that. It is impossible for me to imagine that his point here is deadpan serious to indicate that Plato, what Plato is saying is right in the gorgeous. It's much more likely to be the opposite or it's some more complex joke that we have to really unpack, reading the paragraph before and after, and say, okay, what is he really alluding to here in Gordius? And what is he really saying in making this intentionally um, obfuscatory statement about ethics? All right? He's capable of being clear when he wants to be clear. And he's capable of being mysterious when he wants to be mysterious. This is an intentionally provocative, paradoxical statement. And the idea was that people at that time, they knew, we're lucky, we have this text. So if Plato's dialogue, the Gorgias, had disappeared and been lost to history, we'd never be able to know what he's really talking about. Okay? But in this case, the text does exist. We can look it up and we can try to puzzle out what is he really saying here? And again, this is part of the same argument. He's talking about the inequality between men and women, the inequality between owners and slaves, okay? The very next sentence after this bizarre allusion to Plato, which again, I assume is somewhat sarcastic and insulting towards Plato, is we have a statement that absolutely must be a joke, okay? Now, most people, and I think even most translators, if they're working fast, they miss this joke. And I'll, I'll mention briefly, when I was a very young man, I read the tragedy of Ajax. So the tragedy of Ajax is an ancient play written by Sophocles that's quoted here by Aristotle. So I think I read it for the first time probably when I was still a teenager. And then later in life, I went back and read it again and again. It was really meaningful to me during a certain phase of my life. So I knew the tragedy of Ajax quite well. So there is a quote here that's less than a full sentence long from Sophocles in the tragedy of Ajax. And 
I've spoken to many, many people, including one of my ex-girlfriends. It was a very memorable dialogue. One of my ex-girlfriends quoted this passage of Aristotle to me as proof that Aristotle was a misogynist, that he had a tremendously negative view of women. Okay. <laughs> so he follows up this snarky remark about Plato by saying, quote, we must therefore hold what the poet Sophocles said of women, quote, a modest silence is a woman's crown, close quote. The very first time I read this passage in Aristotle, I laughed. The translator here doesn't get the joke. If you can look up peer-reviewed research. There are peer-reviewed articles that some of the scholars get the joke, some don't. If you know the context he's quoting, this is hilarious. Because the actual situation is that Ajax is receiving advice from a woman that would have saved his life. The situation and the tragedy that's unfolding here is he's saying, no, 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 he refuses to listen to this woman and what she's saying to him is 100% true and profound and good advice. And he's saying, he's basically telling this woman to just shut up while he proceeds to destroy himself and it, it, leads, it leads to his death. So this is a slightly psychologically complex scenario. It's not worth unpacking here. Aristotle isn't just making a joke here. This reveals that his intent as an author, as an author in this whole paragraph is 180 degrees the opposite what a dry, humorless reading of the passage would suggest to us. You might well presume, just reading this in English straight, that he means to suggest to you in a, in a humorless way that women ought to be silent. He means the opposite. He's saying very directly to his audience of the time, he wasn't writing for people thousands of years later, he was writing for the type of learned gentleman in Athenian society who probably would have seen this drama by, so by Sophocles performed live again and again, year after year. Um, they didn't have that many, that many new plays, so they've probably seen it before many times. They'd hear the line and know it, and know this is the story of a man who's destroyed, a man who dies because he ignores good advice from a woman. That it's outrageously funny for him to suggest in this context that the, the relationship between women and men are so love -sided. That women do have good advice, that men should listen to women, and if men ignore women's advice, it leads to their destruction, okay? Now, I know how easy it would be for people to regard what I'm doing in this video as some kind of politically correct excuse-making for Aristotle. I know how easy it is for people to hear something like this and think, oh, here's this guy with a beard in the 21st century who's just trying to reinterpret Aristotle to make Aristotle less misogynist than he is, uh, to make Aristotle seem like he cares more about the slaves than he really does or something. No, 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 no. The ultimate purpose of the, audio, or the argument I'm presenting to you here, apart from just being a warning about how hard it is to read and understand Aristotle, is the argument that we must read ancient texts with a complete sense of detachment about the intention of the author. The intention of the author really matters. And if you come to a text like this, just even with the expectation, um, this is going to define for me, you know, what made Athenian democracy so great? What made democracy in ancient Athens so great? Why do you assume that's his interest? Why do you assume that's his objective? That's not Aristotle's objective. I've made other videos talking about the political conditions he lived in. He was in a very difficult situation. He wasn't from Athens, right? He was from Macedonia. He had a direct connection to the political authorities in Macedonia, the Macedonian Empire, what was going on with Alexander the Great, with the wars that were being fought at that time. His political agenda, his personal interest, why he's writing this particular book, what his thesis is, may have nothing to do with your expectations as a reader. And your frustrated expectations, they won't just lead to you being disappointed with the book. They will lead to you being 180 degrees wrong about the meaning of the book, passage by passage, and about the book as a whole. A very large percentage of this book is a thesis on the meaning of equality. 
and how it is we can have, in some sense, a politically equal society, a society built on political equality, when that society includes such radical inequalities as the relationship between parent and child, husband and wife, slave owner and slave, um, king and the general population, figure like Alexander the Great at that time, to some extent a king, to some extent a military general, whatever you want to say, how is it that we comprise a semi-democratic society with all those contradictions? And even though I've only presented you with these examples for this particular purpose here, I think you'll agree, if you take the time to read this text as a whole, you actually cannot understand the thesis of the book without taking seriously the challenge of just those few passages that rely on such a close reading of other ancient texts that are alluded to in just half a second. But that half a second is the author winking at you, letting you know just how sarcastic he really was, just what a strange, provocative sense of humor he brought to the task, because his task wasn't writing a book that would last 2,000 years. His task was writing a book that would capture the attention and interest of the audience that was alive at that time.